I'll tell you what, I am learning so many things on this build. Last week was learning all about a hip roof, which if you haven't been following the series of this outdoor kitchen build, then check the description for the previous videos. The new thing this week is building a fireplace. There are three major steps of this build. One is the framework. Two is the cement board to hold. Three, the stonework. I wanted the fireplace to be centered to the long side of the space since the entrance will be from this side. Then on either side, I wanted two log storage boxes to keep firewood and to also provide closer fireside seating options. The first thing I did was set up a miter saw station and started cutting all of the boards needed for this stage. I recommend the general purpose Diablo blade, which is my go-to for the miter when I'm jumping from lumber to ply to OSB. Even though I'm working outside, I still throw on my stealth mask respirator to protect my lungs as I'm working. Then when I move to attaching things, I throw on my tough built knee pads. These knee pads are a must have for me. It might make me look like a cyborg, but they are by far the best knee pad on the market. Tough build has included a thigh strap that has two arms to connect to the knee pad, which not only keeps the pad center on the knee, but also gives you full range of motion to walk, bend, or straighten. So when I want to quickly take a knee, I never have to adjust or worry about positioning. A feature I truly love is on the straps. Tough build includes a quick disconnect on both straps so that you can make the adjustment for the pads to fit around your leg, but then from there, use the quick connect to take them off and on without having to loosen the position. The next thing is to start framing to house the firebox. Ideally, I would have the firebox to set in place while doing this, but it was delayed by a few days, so instead I am working off the measurements it should be. Now once I get the firebox in, I'll be able to slip it in from the front to secure it. Fingers crossed the online measurements were correct. Now framing the back. This entire fireplace structure really helps stiffen up the structure overall. It is my hope that it adds enough rigidity that I don't have to add in post gussets. But we'll see after everything is said and done. Now to frame up the log boxes that will sit on either side of the fireplace. So I started by framing out the individual walls first. Another great feature of these tough built knee pads is the non-marring exterior. So you don't have to worry about scratching up surfaces you're working on. These log boxes are framed up in a certain orientation to tie into the fireplace. And I always like to dry build out directional things like this to make sure it looks right before sticking it in place. But this is how it should look. Now I just need to move it into place. Since I already did a test fit, now I just need to move things into their permanent spot then nail everything together. The idea behind these is to not only build in a place to store firewood for the fire, but to also give the space some additional seating. Also, I plan on doing concrete countertops pretty much everywhere. And yes, I will have a separate video on how to do those. But with the weight of the concrete, then also maybe one to two people seating, the top of these boxes are made from two by sixes and built super sturdy. Once all of the framing is done, the last thing they need is a cap to finish them off. And just like that, we have the framing for our fireplace. Oh wait, I forgot the hearth. This is just a small plow. Wait, it's hearth. Hearth? Yeah, hearth. It's earth with an H in front of it, hearth. It's like hearth, but with an H at the end of it. All right, Tisha. So I forgot the hearth. It is just a small platform that will later have a non-combustible surface on top to protect the deck from getting toasted. And that concludes the framing portion, which is the first major step. Step two is adding cement board to the framing. And this will be the backer material that the stonework will attach to in step three. Even though this is cement board, it works a lot like drywall, where you're able to score it and then break off a section. There is this mesh material on the back side, so I typically pop a chalk line and use a utility blade to make a pass or two on my line. Then after scoring it, I would use my fist to give it a firm tap, and you can see how easily it breaks. Then I would get to the back side with the knife to break through the mesh and free the entire piece. Once the piece is cut, it can now be attached to the framing with a special screw meant for cement board. Now just repeat the process to cover up any surface that is gonna be stone, which in my case is a lot. I try to make this go faster by taking a bunch of measurements at once, making all of the cuts needed, and then installing the pieces. The firebox finally came in, so next we set it in place to install it. Silly me, I thought this thing was gonna be light. Nuh-uh. 
It is heavy, but Jacob and I were able to muscle it into place and ramp it up into position with those two by fours you see on the ground. Whew, thank goodness it fit. Jacob worked on securing that center while I continued on rocking. It's nice once I got out from the log boxes because then large panels could be thrown up at once, which of course means less cutting and covering more ground quicker. For these side pieces where a lot of angles come into play, I would actually just hold up a sheet in place and trace the backside. Then I could drop it into the top of the log boxes and make the needed cuts. Make sure you secure this backer board down securely. A place to screw about every seven to eight inches. It might seem like a lot, but just remember that heavy stone will be added next, so you want to make sure it's not going anywhere. After getting all the area covered with rock board, next I tape the seams. Again, this is kind of like drywalling. You're supposed to tape and mud the seams before you get started on stoning, but I didn't want to waste the morning waiting for the seams to dry. So I taped, but then filled in the seams as I was laying down the stone. And that is what I'll move to covering now. The third major step of this project, laying down stonework. It is definitely worth mentioning that I've never done stonework. I've done backsplash once. And while there is some crossover, this was a different animal completely. And one that didn't have a lot of great information available online. If you have stonework on your to-do list, then hopefully my experience will help shorten your learning curve. Let's get into it. First off, you wanna start at the bottom. Stone is heavy, so as you lay down work, it supports the next layer. There are so many choices of stone on the market. I chose one that comes in a narrow sheet and has a long short end that you can puzzle piece together with the next sheet. I use a spacer to create a small gap between my deck boards in this very first layer of stone. I also used a spacer to represent the thickness of mortar, which is the adhesive that sticks it to the cement board. From here, I can mark my stone with a Sharpie, then cut it to the size needed. There are two main ways of cutting stone. First is with a wet saw. It's a table saw, but it has a belly of water to help lubricate the blade and cut. This definitely works well, but gets water everywhere. Instead, my preference for cutting was with a right angle grinder and a masonry blade. I 100% recommend a self mask to protect your lungs from the dust. Then also isotunes to protect your ears. But all in all, a grinder cuts quick. By the way, it's worth mentioning this is real stone, not manufactured. Which means when showing a cut edge, it's okay because it's still stone through and through. When I was buying stone, I noticed some gave the option of buying corner pieces, which seems like a great feature. But this is a stone I wanted and corners weren't an option. So I made my own instead. I would set one side that was mostly made up of full panels, then came back and measured the short pieces needed. Remember that stone is very heavy and needs to be supported until the mortar dries. So once I worked my way up to the log box, I had to install a ledger in place to support the weight of the row of stone that goes above the box's opening. This is a scrap two by six attached to the underside of the framing. Now, as I work to place my stone, I can use spacers to make sure it's level and fully supported. <laughs> On larger areas, I would apply the mortar directly to the cement board, working in a small area at a time. But for smaller areas, like this top space, I found it easier to apply mortar directly to the back of the stone, which is called back buttering. When I made it down to the hearth, I just set in place a 2x4 spacer. Let me pause and explain my situation real quick so that this makes sense. In a perfect world, I would have done all of the countertop surfaces first and then stoned up to it. However, it was gonna be like another week before the concrete forms came in. So instead of halting, I decided to do stonework first and then just leave like a spacer for the countertops to slip in afterwards. So I used a two by four to make up an, a one and a half inch space. It's amazing how quickly things start taking shape. After getting the log boxes done, I moved on to the fireplace itself, which is fun because it's much more open area where I was able to use more full panels of stone instead of having panels that needed a bunch of cuts to fit. I had to do the same thing on the first row of stone on the fireplace opening. This row needs to be supported from the underside somehow. So I just made some kickstands the height needed, or actually just below height needed. This way I could shim up to the exact height once I put a level on it. I jumped up an inch and a half once again to make room for the mantle that I'll later make and slip in. You can see that I just rested a two by four, then started my next row of stone. And this goes way quicker if you have a cut person. And Cindy was kind enough to be mine. 
This meant I could stay in place and trowel on the mortar in the next area, stick things in place, and measure the small pieces that needed to be filled in. Mortar is the adhesive that sticks stone to the cement board. And note that you can get this in different colors. Since I have grayish stone, I went with gray mortar. I used a five gallon bucket to mix it together and whatever mortar you pick out should have the ratio of water needed. When mixing together a liquid and powder, always add liquid first, then powder to it. These bags are heavy, so a trick I do is to use my knees to hold the bag so that I can pour in the amount needed in a controlled manner. I also do that with dog food. I personally only mixed up half a bag at a time. I found that by mixing together a whole bag at once, it would actually set up before I got to it all. You'll wanna use a half inch trowel to spread the mortar. And this has half inch teeth so that when you slop the mortar on in the area you're about to move to, you can use the teeth to drag the excess away. And this leaves grooves in the mortar, which will give air a place to go when you smush the tile into it. Then the rows flatten and create a stuck surface. When placing the stones, you wanna apply a good amount of pressure. I saw the rubber mallet being recommended for use, but I was too nervous to use it on my stone as it broke very easily. So instead, I would use my body weight to push very hard until it stopped moving inwards. I also checked for level about every third row to make sure I wasn't getting off. If I was, I would use a small shim to get it back into level. Remember that this is natural stone, and while they do a good job at making them almost the same, there can be a slight variation from panel to panel. With that, it's common that each panel from a box is from the same batch of stone. So it's a great idea to open multiple boxes and pull them all in a random order. Oh, also I pre-sealed mine. I don't know if this is a good idea, but I thought it was. This way, instead of sealing everything whenever it's vertical and having to watch for drips, you get to seal it off whenever it's nice and flat. Now, one thing I wish I would have done was stagger my seams. Since these panels come with interlocking pieces, I just figured the joint between two would completely disappear. Nah, honestly, it's not that noticeable once things are dry. And don't forget that a TV will go here in the end, but it's still a good tip to pass along from my job to yours. Okay, let's do some tidy work before I call this step done. After the mortar is left to sit overnight, all of the spacers and shims placed can now be removed. The two by fours took a few taps with a hammer, but they slipped out easily enough. Also, there were tons of places I left the stone just go wild, such as the top of the fireplace that will butt up to the mantle. The stone just fluctuates too much to make a straight edge on its own. I found it much better to leave it a little tall, pop a chalk line, then make a straight cut after it was dry. A good Diablo blade eats through the stone quick enough and a grinder is very easy to make a flat cut if you have a good visible line to follow. I also did the same on all of the back areas. I left all of these sides long and then cut them nice and straight to the framing after the fact. Oh, and look at that guys. I can't tell you, I am so happy with the results. Honestly, I was intimidated going into this one. There wasn't very much information out there about how to do stonework and I was nervous I was gonna create a mess. It didn't come out perfect, but I am so very proud of the job I did and love the outcome. This is shots from after the counters were poured, which is another crazy but fun step I'll be covering in this series. If you're a stone worker, then I would absolutely love it if you would leave a comment with your tips, and I'm sure future viewers would enjoy it as well. Also, if you're interested in anything I used or recommend, that's all linked for you down in the description. Good luck if you are tackling a stone project. I'll see you on my next one. Real quick, I wanna thank this video sponsor, which is Ariad. I am a born and bred Texan, so I've always been familiar with Ariad being a high quality boot maker. And while I do have their boots in my closet, they are so much more than that. Ariad has put so much effort into their workwear line for women. That is actually designed by women. The whole line has a superior fit and long lasting comfort that moves with you on the job site. If you've been following along, you've seen me wear their boots as well as their pants in the cooler months that actually have deep pockets as well as side pockets that I use to carry around tools. Now that it's warm weather here in Texas, I have been wearing my Ariat t-shirts a ton. They have a rib collar, drop tail hem, and a relaxed fit. They're ultra comfortable yet equally durable, making them the perfect everyday work shirt. Regardless of what you're after, give Ariat a look as they always think about the fit, the function, and the durability in every item they make. You can use my code down in the description to get 10% off your order. Big thank you to Ariat for not only keeping me comfortable, but also supporting what I do.
If you are looking for some great sawhorse plans, then I have a link for you right here for this one, as well as two other variations. This one's cheap, it's sturdy, it's very quick to put together, and the thing that I like the best is that it's foldable. And it's collapsible.